Good morning, church. I am excited about our 40 days campaign. Uh, what on earth am I here for? Uh, last year we did 40 days of prayer and these spiritual growth campaigns are really firing us up to be as revived as God wants us to be as New Testament Christians. And, and these campaigns help us grow as we embrace different learning styles where you can hear the message on Sundays, uh, you can read and reflect and study and discuss in our small groups and start to, to practice what we're talking about. So different learning styles all coming together over a six-week period. So there'll be six messages. You won't want to miss them that I'll be doing as well as the congregational pastors, Pastor Nathan, Cass, Sam, and, uh, and then six life group discussion times using a workbook that I have here. And Rick Warren, who you saw a snippet of, will be sharing for uh, 10, 15 minutes in the life group. And then we're going to be working through our, this work group, discussing and talking. So the message that we give on Sunday will be reinforced midweek as you work through this, this book. Um, and I want to encourage you. We have, I think, 56 life groups already up and running. We would love to have 70. Wouldn't that be good? Another 14. And so at the end of the service today, if you haven't enlisted or put your name down that you want to be part of a life group, you can do that in the foyer. But more importantly even than this, you may want to start one. You might say, oh, I don't know what to do. We've got the book for you. All what you have to do is be able to press a button on a computer or TV and Rick Warren will appear and there'll be some discussion questions and we'll help you to do it. You might say, well, I, there's only me and another person. Fine. Two people's good. Three's even better. And I know there's one group that is starting with three and there'll be two people who don't know the Lord, just friends of this person that are going to come along. So it's a marvellous opportunity because this question, what on earth am I here for, is one that, that everyone asks, whether they articulate it or whether they feel it, to know what's life all about. And so it's, it's ideal for you to reach out to family members and friends who don't know Christ and to bring them along. And so we don't want anyone in the church to miss out on being part of a life group. Um, and so at the end of today, you can enlist. Wouldn't it be great? The 50, so we get another, another 10 groups starting. That would be terrific. We'll also have a six memory verses, and we're going to give you a bookmark with six verses that are kind of the hook for each week on the theme of what on earth am I, am I here for? And I would encourage you to memorize them, embed it within your heart and your life. And then Rick Warren's book, Redone, The Purpose Driven Life, has been redone. What on earth am I here for? Extra chapters. I read this about 15 years ago, uh, 15 years ago and it's transformative. And so you can purchase this and the booklet for $25 through your small group. If you get them from Kurong or Elsa, it'll cost you probably 35, 40 bucks. So, so the church is subsidizing them. We want everyone to have one. Or if married couple want to share one, that is fine. But to every day to do, and it's, it looks like it's a thick book, eh? But when you break it down to 42 chapters, it's only two or three pages in each one. And as you read it each day, uh, what's going to happen is the learning is going to be reinforced. And I would encourage you to be a part of this. Don't miss out on what God wants to do in and through you. This is a spiritual growth campaign over 40 days, and it can be incredibly transformative. It can change the direction of your life. Uh, when we did it in the early 2000s, we've done several of these campaigns. Um, Alan Steele and Jill, who were part of our pastoral team here, and happily ensconced, serving the Lord here, had come from the Pichinjara lands where they were serving up there in practical, in practical ministry, uh, working for the communities. God started doing something in them and, and it was quite transformed. Alan, come and, and just share with us what happened and the results of it. Okay, Bill. Is it on? Hello. I'll turn it on. Turn it on. Okay. That's it. Right okay, thank you. I want to start off uh, with a verse, Proverbs 5, 
this is Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. That was the experience that I found as true. Uh, that verse was true, I found, when I did the original 40 Days of Purpose program way back 15 years ago, was it? I think Fantastic. so. I, I forget. Yeah. I might have a seniors moment. I thought it was 2007, <laughs> but it's 2004, I think. What, uh, whatever yeah. it was. Uh, it was really good. Um, Pastor Bill said a moment ago that uh, it's something that revives us. And to be honest with you, back then, I didn't realise I needed reviving. Even though I was actively involved in the church in many, many ministries, the things that really excited me, things that thrilled me, uh, I hadn't realised that I needed reviving. Um, I had, as Pastor Bill said, I'd worked for many years amongst the Pitch and Jarrah people in Central Australia. And uh, I'd had a call from one of the Bible translators called Paul Eckert at one stage saying that did any of our young people's teams, because he knew that I had taken teams of young people up into Central Australia, would they be interested to go to a community called Arionga? It was a community I didn't know very well at all. I'd been there once in my life. And uh, a few people, Alyssa, I think you went up there a few times, didn't you, and others? Um, and uh, so I got a connection with this community. And uh, it's, then I started sending teams up there. And uh, then a um, funny thing happened. One day, uh, a person who's on the staff there leading the community uh, rang me up and said, uh, did I know anybody who would be suitable to fulfill the position of the Shire clerk in the community up there? And uh, so I said I'd think about it. And uh, my wife, Jill, and I, we talked about it. And uh, I, I'm... I was starting to find myself interested in it, thinking I could do that. But then there was all the rationalisations that started to come to my mind. I had three lovely little grandchildren and I didn't want to leave them because I knew what I'd done to my grandparents and my parents. Uh, for my grandchildren, uh, I took them away up into Central Australia and they missed out on a lot. So I was quite fearful of doing it. I was rationalising, thinking, well, I'm needed here. I've got a lot of things I do and I'm needed here. Um, so as we went through the 40 Days of Purpose program, as that one was called, um, I was really challenged. Both of us, Jill and I, were really challenged uh, about the messages that come through. And they will challenge you too. Um, but uh, it got to the point where we realised that it was something we should do, to give up our ministry roles here in the church and go and take a position as a Shire clerk. Uh, something I never ever thought I would do. And so we went. We went up there and we found a community that was, I would have to say, in great distress. You know, it was common. But most of the men in the town spent their days in Alice Springs drinking. And every fortnight when the paychecks came, they'd come 200 kilometres back out to Arionga, get the money from the women and children and go back to town and drink it all. It was a terrible situation. They only had about five or six people in that community who worked and had jobs because the men were on this terrible pathway. By the end of our time in Arionga, which was just a few years, we had 55 people working. 55 of those men had regular jobs. We had a kids club going, much like we have here on Friday nights. We had youth programs going. We had more teams you know, from Seton here going up and it was a, an amazing thing. But then, the amazing thing happened was I got a call from Derek Crozer who was leading our church in Alice Springs and it was quite a small work at that stage saying that they really felt that they, they needed to come back to Adelaide and go to a church here, another church here and uh, that they thought we might like to come to Alice Springs and run the church and we of course said no way. Um, we loved what we were doing at Arion. It was so rewarding. It was so rewarding. We, we could feel God in what we were doing. But again, those niggling thoughts kept coming back to us. Um, one of those key ones was that uh, there'd been a vision. of Two people had passed a bill, and one of our young people years ago had a vision of the map of the Northern Territory with uh, churches bursting out all the way along that road up to, towards Darwin. And uh, that was kept coming back to me, niggling. And so... As time went by, we came to the realisation that we were meant to go in uh, to Alice Springs. Of course, the other niggling thing was 
I felt God say one day when I was driving between Arionga and Alice Springs uh, that uh, we need an operational base in Alice Springs. And uh, so those two things made us uh, think about it and we ended up going in to Alice Springs. In a matter of about four weeks we had um, between when we left Arionga and went into Alice Springs to live and to get going on the church, um, we had to find two jobs because Jill and I were both staff at the community so we had to find the jobs. We had to sell a house here in Adelaide, buy a house in Alice Springs and uh, and there was something else, I can't quite remember what it was, but we had a lot of stuff. Oh, we had to have a holiday. And I think, at that <laughs> I think at that stage we had to pack Jeremy and Sandra's house because they were going to New Guinea. Um, but uh, we did it all. It all happened just in that very, very short time. Yeah, good. And uh, then uh, we got into Alice Springs and uh, I found that uh, I was diagnosed to have had lymphoma. Uh, it was a deadly disease at that time. And, and it was an amazing time where we had to face, what do we do? Some people saying, give it up, go and look after yourself. But then we knew God had done all this stuff. Yeah. And now we have uh, a CRC church at Tea Tree, north of Alice Springs. We have indigenous groups as well. And I'd have to say that God has been amazing yeah. in it. Wonderful. Um, trust in the Lord with all your hearts as you do 40 days of purpose. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. He might challenge you. I'm sure he will. Yeah. But do that and you'll do Wonderful. well. Great, Alan. Thank you very much. That's great. <laughs> so Alan and Jill came back to retire here. They run the Friday night program. They do Thursday night chapel thing that one of our groups, they do a whole pile of stuff. No such thing as retirement. It's refinement. And uh, they are such uh, valuable people. But uh, that's one story that's taken place. So during the next six weeks, as you draw closer to God, as you get personally revived and draw closer to him, miracles are going to start to happen. God will start to speak to you and, uh, and give you direction. So he did that with Alan. We've got a church of 200 people in, in Alice Springs. We've got indigenous outreach groups taking place and illness couldn't stop the will of God. Difficult circumstances couldn't stop the will of God. God spoke, God equipped and enabled the steels to do amazing things and they came back and they're doing amazing things still. So, so I trust, hang on to your seat, get ready. Let the Lord do something special over the next uh, six weeks. Folks, we are defined very much by our choices and our choices will determine our destiny. And holding on to certain resolutions firmly held resolutions are good for us we make those usually in january don't we and uh, but some of the resolutions we make are pretty weak and they only last about six weeks and um, um but i'll tell you resolutions won't work just by willpower alone your willpower you need christ's help as you place your trust in him. And, and God has a formula to help you make some life-shaping resolutions that will last. This campaign is all about helping you realise God's, not just general purpose, his specific purpose for you, and that you will know who you are and to know exactly what he wants you to do. And there's a fabulous story in the scripture, the story of Moses. So I've entitled this message here, Choosing Your Future. Moses is a fantastic example of somebody who made four life-shaping choices, amazing choices. Let's just read the story of Moses found in Hebrews chapter 11. I could go through to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and, and, and I've been reading it this week, the story of Moses again. But, but here in the book of Hebrews, in just a few verses, there is a summary of the entirety of Moses' life. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. Why? Because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Evil King Pharaoh had just ordered the elimination of all Hebrew boys. Kill them. Infanticide. A genocide. 
There were 600,000 slaves in Egypt. For 400 years, the Hebrew people were enslaved. The initial pharaoh was a good guy. But then later on, they became enslaved. It was indentured, servitude, and the, the kingdom of, of Egypt blossomed into the greatest empire the world had known then, built on slaves. And when, when, when they left Egypt, there were 600,000 men, just men, and if half of them were married, that's another 300,000, that's 900,000. If those that were married had four kids, that's uh, three, four, two, we're talking about maybe two and a half to three million people that were there. And so Pharaoh goes, too many of them, they populate, these Hebrews, they like having babies. And uh, so he said, they might overtake us, they might overwhelm us. He said, let's kill the boys. And uh, the, the midwives, the, the, the Egyptian midwives who loved babies, they didn't obey Pharaoh. And God was pleased. So they lied to Pharaoh and uh, deceived Pharaoh and they wouldn't kill the babies. They wouldn't, they wouldn't get rid of them. And, uh, and so in this circumstance, to, to escape, Moses' mum and dad made a basket, put tar in it to make it waterproof, stuck it in, in the River Nile. As it's going down, his, his young sister, or his older sister, followed where, where the basket was going and it went to where Pharaoh's daughter was, was washing and bathing. And so she sees the basket, gets a servant to go and say, find out what's in there. They find this little baby and, uh, and fell in love with the little kid. And so, of course, she couldn't nurse the child. So she said, well, look, we've got to find out. It's a Hebrew boy. And so right under Pharaoh's nose, his daughter raises this kid and said, we've got to find a, a, a wet nurse, you know, find a Hebrew woman. And of course, Moses' mum was there, so she was able to nurture the little baby, her child, without telling them, of course, that, that, that she's the mum. And so, um, uh, so Pharaoh was a nasty piece of works, and they wanted to keep the people suppressed. And so by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months. And then verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, notice these key words, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And secondly, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. And by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Key words, refuse, choose, regard, persevere. Moses, in the summary statement of the whole of the story of Moses, it tells us he made four resolutions that altered his destiny, but he needed God's help. He needed the Lord's help. It wasn't just a human resolution. It was a life-changing decision, but he needed God's help to outwork each one of them. Now, you have on your seat this outline. And I've noticed over the past couple of weeks that some of you have been going to sleep during the message. So I thought, not, I'm not looking at you, Glenn or Pete. That's fine. You guys are great. And, uh, but to help you, I haven't filled in the key points, the four key points. They're going to come up there, but you're going to need a pen to write them down. So you see, this is a learning technique. You're only going to hear, but you're going to watch and you're going to do. Who hasn't got a pen? Lift your hand up and the ushers will run straight down. Don't dawdle, guys. Run, but don't trip over. Lift your hands up and grab a pen. Next week, bring your own. Okay, we're all ready. Now listen to me. You can't control what's going to happen to you in 2020. You can't. The only thing you can control is your reaction, your response to what's going to take place. You can't foresee all the unexpected circumstances that will come your way. They are out of your control. However, you can control your choices. You're made with free will. You're different to the animal kingdom. And like Moses, our choices or responses with God's help 
can determine our destiny. So in this passage, there are four key words. I've mentioned them. Moses refused, Moses chose, Moses regarded, and Moses persevered. Firstly, Moses refused to be defined by others. He refused to be defined by others. That's the very first point. So you want to make a life-changing choice? Refuse. Come on, guys, put put on the screenshot, please. Thank you. Refuse to be defined by others. God made you to be you. And he likes you as you are. There will never be another you. Who can sing that song? That's a seeker song. Hey? I won't sing it. Otherwise, you will go to sleep. You're absolutely unique. There will never be another person like you on planet Earth. You're made in his image. Before you were physically created by your mum and dad, he knew you. He had a purpose for your life because he's omniscient. He created you. He loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you on a cross to remove all your sins and to reinstate you back to God the Father, free from guilt, free from sin, free from from fear and shame. He sent the Holy Spirit to come and live within you. You are unique, absolutely unique. And he didn't make you to be what somebody else wants you to be. And like Moses, we need to refuse to be defined by others. In verse 24, which we read earlier, it says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up. Notice he had grown up. Some of you need to grow up through this campaign. And when you grow up to maturity and take responsibility, you will refuse some things. Some of you are still hearing voices from your dad and mum. Some negative voices or a school teacher or a person in authority. They may not even be around, but you're listening to their voices and you're letting them shape your future and your destiny. No more. No more. Draw a line under it. We're going to let God shape our, our future and our destiny because he loves you without any false motives. He cares for you. He has a purpose for you. He delights in you and he wants you to discover something afresh and new about himself and about you and your unique purpose through these 40 days. And it can be transformative, like with Alan and Jill and so many other people who have embraced this. In the story, when you read Exodus, Moses has an identity crisis, a real identity crisis. He doesn't know who he is. Is he a prince of Egypt? Is he a Hebrew slave? He had both cultures operating. He associated with his Hebrewness. He associated with royalty. One is dirt poor slave, bondage. One is a prince with all the pleasures and the the benefits of belonging to to Pharaoh's family. And um, so he's conflicted. And I think that's why he has, he's, he's a bit neurotic, uh, Moses. When you read the story of Moses, he's, he's not all together. He can't talk properly, he's a stutterer, and he's kind of like, I can't speak, and Aaron does the speaking for him. So he has some inner life issues. His marriage, when he gets married to Zipporah, a bit difficult. And the boys, it's like, didn't, didn't seem to be a happy marriage. I think he's just, he's conflicted. He's a difficult person growing up in that culture. And um, he didn't commit adultery or didn't beat his wife up or anything like that, but he was just a very internally conflicted man because he's from two cultures. We we saw a a picture of Dag Heward Mills holding the uh, calipers, whatever, you know, people being healed. Now, Now, Dag, if you look at him, is he Ghanaian or is he European? He's half and half. His mum is Swiss, she's still alive, I've met her. His dad is Ghanaian. And as he's growing up, he doesn't know who he is. So all the Ghanaian boys say, you know, I know, I know, you're just, you're a white fella. So he's receiving prejudice as he's growing up and he says, well, I'm European, am I? And then the Europeans go, no, you're not one of us, you're a black fella. And in school, he gets bullied. He gets persecuted. 
And it caused great conflict, a great sense of an identity crisis. It was that identity crisis in the mid-80s that brought him to Christ. As a medical student, he falls in love with a, a legal student named Adelaide. And uh, they got saved and they start this little church. And out of that, there's now 3,000 churches across the world. And the church in Ghana, with all its branches, would have to be maybe a quarter of a million people. It's just like just massive and the campaigns that they run the board that I'm on and I hope to be there in August this year is uh, they've led over 10 million people to Christ right across Africa it's the number one evangelistic ministry in the world and they run medical clinics educational clinics they bring kids into their hospital they've, they've built a hospital to give free surgery to kids who, who that just don't have the funds amazing ministry but he has an identity crisis. God uses that identity crisis to make him into something. You may be complicated. You may not know who you are. You may be conflicted because of a whole pile of stuff. No fault of your own or even maybe you're the cause of it. There's no limitations to what God can do in you and through you over the next, uh, next 40 days. He can transform you. He can heal you. He can give you a sense of purpose and direction that the next few years of your life are going to be most meaningful and most powerful and most fruitful. Can you say amen to that? It's true. Moses refused to live a lie. He's a man of integrity. And he says, you know what? I'm a Hebrew. <laughs> I'm a Hebrew. These are my people. He didn't hate the Egyptians. He didn't hate his... Pharaoh's daughter, but he knew who he was and he admitted to who he was. He didn't deceive himself. He's a man of great integrity. So who are you letting determine your identity? What are you letting determine your identity? Romans 12 2 says this, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. I love this. But let God remould your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good. Wasn't that great? Refuse, folks, to let the world squeeze you into its mould. I'm just not going to let other people define me. Don't let other people define you. Don't let peer group pressure push you into the things you don't want to do. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, Our purpose is to please God, not people. He is the one who examines the motives of our hearts. I choose to be what God wants me to be. Look at Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. I'm going to live before an audience of one. And his name is Jesus Christ. And I trust that you will do that as well. I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do. And I'm going to fulfill the plan that he has for my life and not somebody else's plan for my life. Secondly, the second life-shaping choice that he made was he, 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 he not only refused, which is the negative, he refused to be defined by others, but he chose short-term pain for long-term gain. It says Moses chose, verse 25, to be mistreated, get this, he chose to be mistreated, pain, <laughs> with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Church, if you're going to be good at anything, you've got to embrace the reality of short-term pain for long-term gain. It's true. This is true for any endeavour of life, whether it's sport, music, finance, relationships, marriage, health. Hey, like my daughter Nikki, she started playing the violin when she was a little kid. She became a world, oh, he's a world class classical violinist. She's travelled the world, done the orchestras. And, uh, but I tell you, the gift was there. She certainly is a little kid when she picked it up. It worked for her. But oh, the gift is 1%. What did, what did Edison say? 1% gift, 99% perspiration. 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Nobody has seen the four hours and the six hours of, 
of practicing and, and the, the marks on her neck and the, the, the difficulties in her body that have taken place. And just a couple of weeks ago, I took Kathy to see Michael Bublé. Hey, we're at the front row. You know, my wife jumped out of the seat to try and touch him. I thought, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Sit back. Get down there. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> Marriage, he's young enough to be your son. You're acting like a teenager. Anyway, <laughs> I took her there. Slight exaggeration, that's okay. I took her there because Nikki was asked to lead the string section. He's got 150 member, he's got 150 people on his band that travels around the world. So somebody said, Nikki, somebody in authority, Nikki, we know you don't like doing popular stuff because you're a classical violinist, but could you run the string section that are Australian musicians? So, so Nikki was there and I thought, Nikki, get me a free ticket. She couldn't do that, so I paid. I won't tell you what I paid. But it was great to take my wife out on a date. But watching my daughter there doing that, I thought, if only people knew. Not just her, but all those musicians. The guy with the saxophone. A, a, a beautiful black man, African. What could he play the trumpet? And I thought, he's been playing that. He probably practices four to six hours a day. And, and so there is no gain without pain. And uh, in sport, it's the same. There's no gain without pain. And uh, Moses chose, get this, he chose to be mistreated. He chose pain. Wow. Most of your problems, hear me on this one, most of your problems in life come from your inability to delay gratification. You want everything instantly. You want it now. But just, that's just not life. It doesn't happen that way. And the right thing to do is not the easy thing to do. Doing the right thing can be hard and very painful. Whereas doing the wrong thing comes so easy and is initially pleasurable. You see, it says here that he, he could have enjoyed the pleasures of sin. Anything he wanted to do, whenever he wanted to do it, he could do it there in the palace he was like a king he could do whatever he wanted to do he was free to do what he wanted to do but I tell you what there are terrible consequences that that come <laughs> and he knew that and he realized and it says there in scripture that rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time the devil wouldn't tempt us to sin if it wasn't pleasurable so all temptation is pleasurable. He shows us the best, but he hides the worst. And Moses had it all. But he could see the long term and realise it's going to end up with a mouthful of gravel. You know, a mouthful of gravel, like you're running after something and you trip and psh, split your lip. And, and I remember once my dad was chasing me because I, I don't know what I did to him. I must have done something. He's chasing me. He's going to give me a nice old whack on the backside. Always the backside. And... Um, and so I'm running and then I tripped and I fell headlong into a whole pile of stinging nettles. Wow, and I had shorts on. Red, red. Dad looked and said, that's his punishment. <laughs> there are consequences. You know, I forget what I was doing, but I did some terrible things. I remember once I grabbed his petrol can. I'm only a little kid. I grabbed his can of petrol. He was on the farm. And I poured the petrol out in a great big line, great big line. Had the can there, got a match, and went boom. And he thought I was going to, he thought it, he thought I was going to kill myself. So, uh, so when he got me, he gave me a decent hiding on the backside, and I deserved that one. I don't normally say kids should be belted, but that one I deserved because it was my my safety, you know. Like, so uh, we don't realise it's pleasurable. To see petrol going up, smell it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the consequences are something chronic. You're not free from the consequences. You can say, I'm free to have sex with whoever I want to have sex with. This is our, our society. But there's pregnancies that are consequences. There are STDs that are consequences. And most damaging is, is sex is created for intimate relationship. And when people just make it as a physical act and they give their heart, 
they're giving something of themselves and you can never get that back again. Only through the redemption of Jesus, the healing of Jesus. And so that's what Paul says. He goes, you give yourself that way. He goes, this is meant with one person for life in a, a, a relationship of commitment and responsibility. It's not a toy to just... And for those of us who have been burnt that way, it's taken the Lord to heal our hearts. Um, and so doing the right thing can be hard and painful. Whereas the wrong thing comes so easy and it's initially pleasurable. You're getting hurt. And, and the people that you're closest to are the ones that can hurt you the most. And it's so easy to pay back. It's so easy to give your partner the silent treatment. It's so easy to punish them. So easy to... You don't have to be physically violent. You can be violent in your emotions. You can, be, you can pay back. It can be your father, your mother, your sister, your friend. You can just hurt them by not communicating, by not engaging. And it feels good to pay back. It's easy to pay back. You just follow your normal sinful nature. But it's as hard as anything to forgive that person and, and to, to say, you know what, I'm going to choose to love, I'm going to choose to forgive. And if you live in, in you know, hurt people are the ones that end up hurting people. And so uh, payback doesn't work, but forgiving them, and payback can be easy, but I tell you, forgiving them is hard, but it's the only way. Pain can work in your favour when you place your trust in Jesus and you hang on to him through the difficulties that life can bring. Look what Romans 5 says, we can have joy in our troubles. Hey, because we know that these troubles produce something. Problems produce things. If you put your trust in Jesus, Produce patience and patience character and character hope. Look at 2 Corinthians. It says, these present troubles are quite small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. So Moses, in verse 24, refuses certain things. And in verse 25, he chooses things. The negative is followed by the positive. Before we make lasting resolutions, folks, we may need to do some refusing and then some choosing. And God may be saying to you, you've got to refuse some things. If you're going to enter into God's best for you before you can, you're free to make certain choices. You may have been stung and you're feeling the consequences of wrong choices, wrong decisions. You need healing. You need the Lord to help you. Or maybe you're in that phase where you're, you're yielding to temptation and you think it feels good. I want to do it. Stealing something that doesn't belong to you. Saying things that are not true. Playing around with another person's emotions when you have no intention of, of, of having a, a long-term relationship with that person. And you might be saying, you need to refuse those things. You've got to get out of it. Because it, it, it seems the devil will show you the best, but he'll hide the worst. There are consequences. You've got to learn to forgive your spouse. Unforgiveness. I mean, all of us were shocked this week by the terrible crime that took place in Brisbane. You know, it's unbelievable. You just think, how the heck can a grown man burn his children to death and his wife? And, and, you know, and all, all, everyone's pontificating of what the issues are. And, and I, I read what the brother said, her brother and mother. And they said, this guy's been nursing hatred for a long time. He's, he's had a friendship with resentment. His buddy is hatred. Control. He never hit her. Never hit her once. But he was hitting her with his words and he was hitting her with his emotions because he's a violent man on the inside. Only when she left him did he hit her. As far as I'm concerned, the cops should have then arrested him, put him in jail for six months and forced some treatment on him. You know, I just I don't, I can't understand that. Anyone hits a woman, a wife, put him in jail for six months, get him some psychologists and don't let him loose because it's in those first three months where they end up killing somebody, not afterwards. So what's he doing? He's nursing He's nursing his resentments, his bitterness. And ultimately, rage comes in. And then an anointing from hell comes upon him. 
in an act of absolute evil where he says, I'm going to kill them all and kill myself. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. People don't say, I'm going to go and kill somebody. It's what's happening on the inside. Jesus says all these things are on the inside and they've got to be dealt with. So if there's issues of lust and anger and, and uh, impurity and, and uh, aspects of the inner life that nobody can see but Jesus, he wants to heal your heart. He wants to break the power of that thing and realize there are terrible consequences if you keep yielding to them. And so Moses refused and he chose. Moses did the refusing and the choosing when he had grown up. It says when he had grown up. <laughs> it's interesting. That's the mark of maturity, growing up. When you grow up, you refuse some things and you choose some things. I was a child, now I'm an adult. <laughs> and uh, you realise, hey, there are consequences. And when you get married, you think, man, she's the most beautiful creature in the world. And you're the most handsome guy in the world to her. And you think, man, that's all we need. We just need chemicals flowing and it's all going to be great. Honeymoons end really quick. And real living, real loving, real adjusting, real conflicts occur. And I remember three months after we got married, I didn't tell Kath this for a long time, and I woke up in a cold sweat. I shivers down my, my back and I open up and, and she's lying there asleep. And this thought came and said, oh, she's always going to be there. <laughs> she's always going to be there. What have I done? The full consequences, the full consequences of my decisions came upon me only lasted for a little time but you know you, you gotta you gotta you grow up marriage makes you grow up then you have your act together after two and a half years you think man we finally got our act together and then you produce a baby and you got to start from scratch again and you realize how impatient you are how unloving and then you, think, oh, and then you have a second one and a third one and a fourth one and I would have gone on for a fifth one until she went on strike and that was it but you grow and you've got to adjust. That's a mark of maturity. It means I'm becoming responsible. You see, we are products of our past, guys. There's no denying it. But we don't have to be prisoners of our past. Yes, your past has influenced you. But it doesn't have to control you. We refuse bondage. And we choose liberty. Liberty. And that's, Moses saw that for his people. And, and he's saying the same to us today. We can get free. We can really get free. Choose short-term pain for long-term gain. That's what Moses did. Refuse to be defined by others. And thirdly, choose God's values and not the world's. Look at verse 26. Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. In other words, he says, I'm going to be treated as a slave as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Moses is making a value judgment. Throughout this campaign, your values are going to be challenged. He's clarifying to himself what matters most. What matters most in your life? What are your top values? You should be able to rattle them off. So this is what motivates me. We have six values as a church. And back in the, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, people said, well, Bill, well, what are the unique values? We know what our declaration of faith is. We're evangelical, Pentecostal, not, not our doctrines. We know those. But what do you really value? And it really came out of my own heart and, and my own life. And then when we did an exercise and we got all our leaders together and we listed down, well, what do you think are the key values? You know what, what they came out of? And we've listed them in the back. You can see them. They're on the wall. Authenticity. Not being a fake. Being a real Christian, a real church. Authentic. Integrity. Not being dishonest in any way. In the little things as well as the big things, to be people of our word that will follow through. Dignity. We're not going to be disrespectful of people who are made in God's image and whom Jesus died for, no matter how difficult they may be. We've got to learn to like all people. We don't have to agree with them. We don't have to endorse what they do. Stability, not being flaky in spiritual matters. Man, I got sick of flakiness. I saw such flakiness around in some church circles and Christians are up and down like yo-yo, yo-yo Christians. Oh, no. Man, Lord, I just want to be stable. And that's a key feature of our, of our church. Proactivity. 
not remaining stationary in our faith expression, but always moving forward in faith and trust with new visions, missionaries. Wouldn't it be great to be able to, we raised $140,000 last year for world missions. Wouldn't it be great to raise a quarter of a million dollars over the next few years every year? Plant new churches, put up new buildings. And excellence, not being mediocre, but doing our very best for Jesus. See, if you don't decide what's important in your life, other people are going to decide for you and they will push you into their mould. Moses chose God's values. And what are the world's values? Well, let me list them down here for you. Popularity, pleasure, possessions, or status, sex and salary. (laughs) You know, people pursue those. Popularity, status, you know, prestige, power. Pleasure, the pleasures of sin, possessions, your salary, the treasures of Egypt. Moses decided he wasn't going to live by the world's values. He walked away from what people spend their entire lives trying to get. And you may need to walk away from some things. The world and everything in it, 1 John 2, 17, that people desire is passing away, but those who do the will of God live forever. You will live forever when you do the will of God. What does God value? You know what he values? Purpose, people, peace of mind, purpose. God's purpose is more valuable than popularity. People, God's people are more valuable than pleasure. Peace of mind, God's peace of mind is more valuable than all the possessions in the world, guys. You see this in this passage of scripture. Moses tells us to look ahead because vision sets values. And what we're looking at reveals what we value. If we keep our eyes on Jesus and his purpose for our life and for our church, that's what we're going to value and prize above all else. And finally, let's look at the fourth life-shaping choice Moses made. It's the final resolution and it will change your life dramatically. Choose to live by faith and not by fear. Instead of fear. It says in verse 27 of Hebrews 11, what we read, by faith Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. He faces up, Moses faces up to the most powerful man in the world. The Egyptian empire was number one in the world. Pharaoh's word was law. He could say, kill all the boys, and they had to do it. If they didn't do it, they'd be killed themselves. He could say to you, divorce your wife, marry that person. You had to do it. There was no parliament. There was no legal structure. His word was law. And he confronts, when you read Exodus, you think, man, he can hardly speak. And he confronts this guy. And he says, God tells me that you've got to let our people go. They're not going to be slaves anymore. We're pursuing freedom and liberty. We're going to create a new nation. It's going to be a nation of laws. First one ever created in human history. God's going to be the king. And we're going to choose laws that respect him and respect each other. And he came up with a legal code, a social code that was amazing. And we still base, in many respects, the principles of our Western civilization. Start out with the Ten Commandments. We've ignored the first few. But you think of of our legal system, not bearing false witness. Not lying, not stealing. We've thrown out adultery. You know, oh, that's that's okay to do that. And we throw out God's big basic laws at our own peril. Society goes down the tube if you don't adhere to them and you ignore him. And so, by faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He confronts him. And the king could have had him killed, but Moses is so strong and he persevered. You see, the closer you get to Jesus, and because Moses was close to God, very close to God, he had less fear. In fact, he had more contempt for Pharaoh at the end. The closer you draw to Jesus, the less fear you will have in your life. See, Paul says, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin in Romans. Hebrews 11 says that that it's impossible to please God without faith. And Jesus affirms in Matthew, according to your faith, it will be done to you. See, what matters most is not the size of your faith, but the size of the God you put your faith in. 
And the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is majestic, he's all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all good. And we're going to paint a picture of how wonderful and big and awesome this God is. And he's a safe space. He's not wicked, he's not bad. You can safely place your trust in him. Alan and Jill did that, not knowing what was going to take place. And they've proven it in spite of difficult circumstances and illness. And God will speak to you and tell you what to do. And he's going to equip you and empower you. As you find your purpose and meaning in him. A little faith in a great big God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, will produce big results. So how do you keep your resolve? Guys, you've got to get support. You can't do it on your own. This is where life groups come in. You're not meant to go through life on your own. You need to be a part of a, of a small life group. You need a spiritual family as well as a natural family. I have a wonderful natural family. But, you know, in some respects, spiritually, I'm closer to my spiritual family than some members of my extended family because they don't know Jesus as, as we know him. And I need you, you need me, we need each other to do life together in a small group. Our board of elders is what, eight of us, nine of us, that oversee all the churches. We're a small group. We spend half our time praying for each other and talking about spiritual matters. Our senior leadership team of five of us here at the Seton Church, we spend a lot of time just talking, sharing, having coffee, eating, and doing some work. People go, oh, you know, like, people say you should be agenda driven, have everything. I think, well, you know what? Yeah, look, we're a bit slack on some things, but I'd sooner have relationship that I enjoy meeting with people and doing life together. And when I'm down, they can lift me up. And when, when they're down, I can lift them up, that we actually serve the Lord together. We all need a life group. Look at Hebrews. It says, let us be concerned for one another and not, and help one another show love and do good. That's what a life group does. It helps you to show love and, and to do good to other people. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage each other. If you're not part of a small group, you're going to miss out. How do you keep your resolve? Ask for Jesus' help and expect Jesus' help. Look what Isaiah says. Because the sovereign Lord helps me. In other words, he's saying, I'm expecting him to do it. I will not be dismayed. Therefore, I have set my face like, like a stone. That's commitment. I'm determined. That's resolution. To do his will. And I know that I will triumph. That's faith that believes I'm going to make it. Church, are you ready to make these four life-shaping resolutions that would change your life? I want you to make that commitment. I made that commitment. On Friday morning... I met with the, the Friday morning service. I'm aiming to speak at all four services. And we produced this little commitment slip and I signed it. I said, yep, the next 40 days, God, I want you to do something fresh and good in me. I need it. I'm a fairly spiritual person, but I need it. I need reviving. I need to be stirred up. I'm thrilled with it. Particularly after going through some wars. You know, I went, I went through a war <laughs> the last six months. <laughs> And uh, so now it's a time of peace, a time of rebuilding, a time of, of strengthening. And we'd love you to make a commitment. And to help you, we've actually produced this and the ushers are going to bring it to you right now. I want you to grab it and I'll go through it with you. I don't want you to see it because stick it in, stick it in your book with your bookmark. But this is to help you. So ushers, quickly, run down the front and give them out quick. Let's not waste time. Man, I wish I was an usher. I'd be the best usher in the world. They're running here, running there. You guys are great. I'm just teasing you. I tease my grandchildren chronically. I make up stories all the time. And one of them came out to me and says, Bapu, we don't believe anything you tell us now. Church, this is your commitment slip. Seriously. Will you make this commitment today? I want to lead you in a prayer in a few moments. Then we're going to sing a song. It says this, with God's help from this day onwards, and search your name, I, Bill Vasilakis, 
Refuse to be defined by others. Choose short-term pain for long-term gain. Choose God's values, not the world's. Choose to live by faith instead of by fear. I commit to go to a CFC seat and service each week for the next six weeks. Guys, you don't want to miss a Sunday. If you can't be here at 10.30, come at 8.30. If you can't be there, come at 5.30. Come Friday morning because the six messages are geared. It's like a spear. They fit in with exactly what we're going to do in the six weeks of our life group. Commit yourself. If you're unable to because of mobility or, or, or health issues, you can watch Dr. Rick Warren's small group sessions and discuss them with a friend. So we will get you this book if you cannot be in a life group. Like there are people like Meg Mitchell who cannot be because she was in hospital. And, but we're, we're taking the life group to her. No one's going to miss out. She wants to be part of it. Read one chapter a day for the next 42 days. What on earth am I here for? Look, the devil's going to oppose you on this. He's going to bring a whole stack of distractions. Because he hates the idea of you reading the Bible and getting yourself fired up. Because that makes you dangerous to the dominion of darkness. To extend the kingdom of God, it'll flow as, as you get revived. And so as you do a daily reading and go through the book and start and then memorize... Memorize the weekly verse and we'll, we'll do it every Sunday. Every service, we'll do one verse as the linchpin. Will you sign it and date it? Today is what the date today, the 23rd of February. And then fold it up and stick it in and say, this is a commitment I've made. I've got a stack of these commitments that I've made. I keep them in my Bible. I got them there over the years and I go over them and say, I made that commitment back then in 1996 or, or 19... I remember back in... In uh, 1994, I recommitted my life at a Billy Graham evangelistic symposium out the front and just uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And something changed at that particular time. And out of it, our world missions vision and church planning strategy started to, to take focus as I, as, I, as I yielded to him, to God. I said, God, I just want to be a vehicle for the gospel to penetrate this dark world. I don't want to play church anymore. I want to expand the kingdom. It's amazing. Just simple commitment, rededicating myself to him and his purposes, how ideas came to flow. If you've signed it, or even if you haven't signed it now, but you want to sign it later today, I encourage you. Can we stand together? I'd like to lead you in a prayer. As you hold this commitment slip in your hand, Let's close our eyes. I want to lead you in a prayer, an important prayer dedication. I've urged you to make these four life-shaping resolutions. And I'm going to ask the Lord by his Holy Spirit to empower you to keep them because you can't do it on your own. They're going to set you on a successful course. The next six weeks, you're going to look at God's plan for your life in, in a lot of detail. Nothing happens until you make wise, good choices. Father, I pray for every person standing here as they hold this commitment slip, as they sign it. I pray, Lord, that they won't drift through these next 40 days. I pray that they'll get engaged in their hearts that they'll find fresh direction and purpose. And like Moses, Lord, we want to make life-changing, transforming resolutions. So, Lord, we, we resolve not to let other people define us anymore. We want to be what you've made us to be. And, Lord, we, 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 we choose short-term pain even to have long-term gain. We choose to do the right thing, not just the easy thing. And Lord, we resolve for the rest of our lives to live by your values, not the world's values, which are not going to last. And Lord, help us to live the rest of our lives the best we know how by faith and not fear. We don't want to live in fear. We don't want to be fear-driven anymore. Father, help us, empower us in Jesus' name.